Welcome to Intangibles, a podcast about the traits, behaviors, and qualities that entrepreneurs can cultivate to help be successful. This podcast is created by Andeseed Ventures, an enterprise-focused seed stage venture firm in New York City. You can find us at www.antecedent.vc. I'm your host, Steve Berg. This season is brought to you by Denton's Venture Technology Group at dentonsventurebeyond.com. Operating as a boutique within the world's largest law firm, the Venture Technology Group runs with hard-charging tech entrepreneurs to drive growth through strategic business, finance, and legal advice from Silicon Valley and New York to London, Berlin, Hong Kong, and beyond. Learn more at dentonsventurebeyond.com. Today's intangible quality is one I've kind of made up. For lack of a better term, I'm calling it inherent greatness. This quality is the mixture of confidence, charisma, and vision that an entrepreneur, founder, or business leader exudes when telling their story. This is a quality that makes investors want to invest, customers want to buy, and employees want to commit their time and energy to the company that person is a part of. I guess one could call it leadership, but I think it's more than that. There are some individuals that are transcendent. Oscar Wilde would refer to these people as the personalities that move the age. I imagine every investor would like to partner with this type of extraordinary figure. My guest today needs little introduction. Liz Clayman is the anchor of the Fox Business News show, Countdown to the Closing Bell, which airs daily at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. She's been a cable television mainstay for nearly 20 years. Hi, Liz. Thanks so much for talking to me. Uh, Yeah, 20 years. Thanks for reminding me how quickly time flies. Pleasure to be here. (laughs) I want to give people some context. Just the cable part of your career is 20 years long. Mm -hmm. You've interfaced with countless CEOs. You've written a book where you interviewed some of the greatest financial minds in the 21st century. You go to Davos World Economic Forum annually, where you speak to the best and the brightest business and world leaders. And among other things, you're known to spend time in Silicon Valley talking with technology luminaries. What did I miss? Well, I'll tell you something. You miss the fact that I spent nine years before that sort of sharpening my chops in local news, where on any given day I was covering a school board meeting, a torso with no head floating up on Castle Island in Boston, maybe a Cleveland Browns game from the, as they called it, the dog pound, which were the cheap seats where all the energy is. Or, you know, I was covering a whale carcass floating up on the coast of Rhode Island. Those nine years were super formative for me, Steve, just to look at a story from a different angle. You know, chocolate festival. You're going to walk in there and just say, well, thousands of people showed up today. No, you. St- I always like to start micro versus macro. You are looking at a 38-pound chocolate tongue or whatever. You know, I was always looking for something that was different to grab people's attention. And because I had that training, I was able to transition to business news about which I knew very little. I mean, I never owned a stock. My father used to own Kodak. He was a surgeon. My mom was a Shakespearean theater actress. We didn't own stocks in California except for Kodak. And he'd say, I'd buy low, sell high, put you kids through college. We had five kids in the family. So, listen, surgeons did well in Beverly Hills, darling. What can I say? But not well enough to send five kids nearly at the same time simultaneously because we're all close in age. And so by going out and starting in local news, I was able to spot an interesting story, no matter what the skeletal structure of it was. So, and you didn't really follow a traditional career path, which I think is interesting. You didn't, like you said, you didn't go to business school. You didn't choose the journalism route. You really didn't come through the front door. Did you? No, I didn't. In fact, I turned down graduate school in journalism. I applied to Stanford, USC, and UC Berkeley graduate school in journalism. I got into SC and Cal, Berkeley. Um, But at the time, I was already working as a gopher, you know, fancy term, news associate. I was a production assistant gopher at KCBS Channel 2 in Los Angeles, where I had interned a summer before. And when I got accepted... One of the managing editors, a guy named Don Dunkel, who's a giant in the industry, he was teaching at USC. He was sort of an adjunct professor. And, uh, you know, little old me, I, and not, Mr. Dunkel, may I make an appointment with you to ask about USC graduate school in journalism? And he said, sure, come on in. Shut the door. 
closed the door and he said, don't go. I teach there, but you're already doing what they're sitting in a classroom learning how to do. And so I went to my father, who was very big on education. You know, you come from a, I come from a very sort of educated, reach higher, you know, Jewish family where they say, you know, education, education. And my sister was already getting her graduate degree. And I said, I know I was accepted. I've got to turn it down. And to my father's credit, he said, you know, Liz, you know your world better than I know your world that you want to be a part of. If you feel that you can do better without that graduate degree, then go for it. And when I explained it to him and I said, Dad, I'm already driving reporters. You know, at the time it was Paul Azan, Ann Curry, Pat O'Brien, Jim Lampley, uh, Steve Kometko was doing an entertainment. These are, these are all people who were at the local level. And I'd drive them. I'd pick their brains. I'd then take them out to the plane crash site and I'd watch them in action. Ross Becker showed me how to do things. You know, all these names back then. And my dad said, I suppose it's like this. It's like going to sea without a compass. If you go to sea without a compass, okay, so you're stumbling around a little bit. But if you never go to sea at all, then there's no point. So it's, it's funny. I've always thought of you as having this kind of underdog persona, but maybe it's much more about you actually having a street education as opposed to, a, you know, a, you know, formal education. Mm-hmm. I mean, you really learned it that way, right? Well, yes. Uh, and of course, I took journalism classes undergrad at Berkeley. And I had some very, very strong professors who taught us the, the bones of how to look at a story, who, why, where, what, how. Also how to write succinctly, but facts are the most important thing. And this one teacher, uh, you know, and he was this, this professor, Andrew Stern. He had worked at ABC back in the glory days. And, and he was, he showed us all these old Edward R. Murrow, See It Now broadcasts. You know, uh, there was one called Harvest of Shame about the plight of the migrant worker. There was one called Diary of a Bookie Joint, the first use of undercover cameras. Uh, and then, of course, the big one, which was the story of Milo Radulovich, which was the story upon which Good Night and Good Luck was based. The McCarthy hearings attacking this this young private in the army just because he had a Russian last name and the whole communist era stuff. And and I realized then when Edward R. Murrow did that story, that was sort of the beginning of the end for that senator, McCarthy. And I realized the pen may be mightier than the sword, but television may very well be mightier than everything. So I dove right in. Um, I don't want to sit here and say I, I went to the school of hard knocks in any way, shape, or form. I did scratch my way through to get my first on-air job, and I was turned down multiple times for the production assistant job, but I just, was like weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. I kept coming back. I kept coming back, but you know, I had a very supportive family, and I looked at it as, well, geez, Liz, you, you better succeed. You know, you had a roof over your head, food in, in the refrigerator, you know, parents who loved me. And it was my job to pay them back with success. So my sense is that that differentiation has come to be kind of a competitive advantage to you. When you look at all the other people that are doing all the same thing within the, you know, business news space. Well, I took the shot that a lot of people don't. A lot of people look at news reporters on the air and say, I want to do that. I want to anchor entertainment tonight. I want to anchor the news. I want to be out in the scene, you know, describing the murder. Yeah, you got to be a special type of person to want to do that. I was that person. I wanted to be at the three alarm fire. Um, But then they hit that wall. And the wall is, are you going to really scratch your way to climb over with no ropes, no footing and no help? And that means going to a small town can't just start in LA or New York, going to a small town and making your mistakes there and learning. Now, I was lucky. So I put together a little resume tape. I would go in on Saturdays at Channel 2, make friends with the cameramen, and they they would let me shoot little fake, you know, we called them stand-ups. I was really bad. Let's just be honest about that. No, I was very stiff. Elizabeth Clayman, Channel 2 News. You know, the people are dead, but the neighborhood is safe. Insert fake smile here. 
Channel 2 News. I mean, I was horrible. But okay, like Teddy Roosevelt, our great president, once said, if somebody asks you to do something you don't know how to do, say, sure, I can, and then start learning how to do it. And, and I learned to mimic, but not take somebody's style. I learned to mimic some of what people were doing, the experts that I was working with. And at that point, I realized I hit that wall, and was I going to actually bloody my fingers, proverbially, to climb over it? And that meant moving to a small town. I happened to fight my way in to the third rated station in Columbus, Ohio, WSYX. I literally filled my car with my blow dryer and some clothes and whatever I could, no bed, nothing, and a couple of sets of sheets, and I moved to Columbus, Ohio. I recall someone giving you that advice, find the number three station. Yes. Yes. That's exactly what happened. Um, my, you know, I would pick the smartest guys' brains in in the whole newsroom, and those were the cameramen and the audio guys. And and I'd say, what should I do? And they'd say, when you're applying, don't go to tiny markets. Go to top thirty markets or top fifty markets in top fifty cities, but only apply to the third rated. Back then, there was no Fox. There were no. There was no CW. So it was ABC, NBC, or CBS. No cable. I'm that old. And um, <laughs> and they said, just apply to the third rated stations. They'll take a chance on somebody who hasn't been on TV. Right. So I applied to WSYX. Back then we had to look through broadcasting and cable workbook and we'd, we'd find out which was rated number one, two, and three. And I studied the town. Another cameraman said, call up the Chamber of Commerce. Again, this was before Google, well before Google, 1987. I said, Call the Chamber of Commerce, find out why the mayor's fighting with the police chief, uh, the biggest corporations there, et cetera. I did all of that, and I learned how to pronounce things like the rivers, Olentangy River, not Olentangy, Scioto, not Scioto River. And I walked into that interview, and I said, I know this town. I know why your mayor is fighting with the police chief. I know how that city council member just recently died, and he was much loved, and why didn't you lead with Rockwell International getting the NASA space station contract? Rockwell's based here. And they were looking at me. And it was sort of that 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000 moment where I was waiting. Are they mad at me for saying this? But this news director looked at me and said, you could sell pearls to an oyster. Well, so, so I agree with that. I mean, I think it's when you describe yourself – I don't necessarily see it the same way. To me, you're such a natural when it comes to interviewing people. I'm struck by your natural curiosity. You're so quick on your feet. And maybe most of all, you have this joyful disposition, which I assume <laughs> comes from either the responsibility and privilege of, of um, you know, being allowed to do what you do. Yeah, um, I'm grateful. Or, or feeling responsible for, you know, being the person who delivers the message. Um, am, am I misassessing Not these? at all, not at all. And it's scary that you're reading me this well and I'm getting up and I'm leaving. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, I don't always have a peaceful, dis sweet disposition. Just ask my parents. In fact, my dad used to say about me in Yiddish, uh, which was his first language, on, which means she goes up in flames. But then I burn out. I'm like flash paper. So it's not that bad or painful. But, you know, redheads, what do you expect? Um, I always tell my staff here that from 2.59 to 3.59 p.m. Eastern, I'm going to be a different person. I'm going to really get upset if we get facts wrong. Uh, in commercial breaks, I may yell, May drop the f bomb. What can you say? You know, I get very passionate about informing people. Yeah, yeah. And I don't want to be wrong. It's really important to me. People are making investment decisions based on what we talk about. So, as best we can, we've got to get everything right. Yeah, and not only that, I think you're you're pretty well known for getting the big interview. Um, that's something that, you know, has followed you throughout your career. And I spent some time trying to analyze just exactly why that is. And I came to the conclusion, it's all the stuff that we just talked about, right? It's that you come across as this, uh, hardworking underdog, you're a driven personality, you make people kind of want to talk to you. And it's, I mean, it's obviously clear that you love what you do. Well, it's an art, but also again, going back to local news, you had to knock on the door of people who were going through the worst day of their life. 
The guy who ran our editing department in Cleveland, where I went after Columbus, I went to News Channel 5 in Cleveland, where, listen, it was a very aggressive station. They'd say, you know, just get out to the scene, set up the live truck and go live. We don't care. We'll break in. I mean, I think our motto was first at six, correct at 11. And we, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we yeah, uh, uh, we tried very hard to to just get out there and be quick. But on these horrible days where there were tragedies, Kevin, the guy who was in charge of editing, would walk through past all the edit bays and say, well, somebody's having the worst day of their life. Mm -hmm. And I always try to keep that in mind. So when you're knocking on doors and convincing people, you know, Ron Brown, the Commerce Secretary's plane went down. He was going to Yugoslavia. This is years ago. I was in Boston at the time. And... A bunch of people who had gone to Harvard were on that plane, not students, but alums who were very big people, very successful, worked in the government, had real passion for what they did. And one of them, they said, my station said, go knock on the door and talk to his family. And as I approached the door, I thought to myself, hold on, turned around to my cameraman and I said, go back in the car, go sit in the car. I knocked on the door. This man's sister answered, adult. She looked like death warmed over. She was devastated. They were a very close family. And I said, I just looked at her and I said, I'm Liz from Channel 7, WHDH. Tell me now and I will walk away. I kept my cameraman in the car. You can see him. He's out on the street. I didn't want to just jump all over you and do this and... and I just want to talk about your brother, and it's up to you entirely, but we'd love to know how he lived, not how he died. And she agreed. And I walked in. Her other brother was there. All the relatives, everybody was devastated. But I waited, and then I signaled to my cameraman. He came in. We quietly set up. I said, no tripod. Just sit down in a chair. Let's get out of their hair as soon as we can. But I always believe that by telling the story of these people, of the victims, they would be remembered. Or in the case of a, a murder victim and their parents, when I'd speak to the parents, we might solve it if somebody saw the piece and said, I noticed something weird the other night. I mean, I've put out stories where the media solved, helped solve the case because we broadcast the story details. So when you transition to business, I never bash people over the head. That's not my style. Now, it works very well. My old good buddy, may he rest in peace, Mark Haynes over at CNBC, he was my co-anchor. He had the tough touch. I prefer to have the iron fist, but with a velvet glove over it. You know, it's, it's, it's just easier for me. And it works with my personality. I mean, my goodness, my parents are Canadian. I can't come out screaming at people. <laughs> so I think what you've just described um, is the secret of your success, honestly. This kind of microcosm of being able to find the, that kind of happy medium of, of what a person needs. Let me switch just for a second to process for a minute. Mm -hmm. So I've heard you mention that you're good at getting a person you're interviewing to give you news-making answers. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you how do you do that? <laughs> Open ended questions. Also, having no fear. Going back to local news, I had to walk up to people like Congressman Buzz Lukens just after his trial for having sex with an underage African American girl, and this was a Republican uh, family man, Congressman. And right after the trial, I'm, sh you know, we all would run in there and we'd shove the mic in and, and you just had to have a Teflon skin. So I just make sure I have a measured tone. And unless somebody is a criminal, what is the point of beating them up? I love telling great business stories, great entrepreneurial stories. I'm not interested in beating up somebody for taking a chance at something and failing and then trying to come back and trying again and again. I mean, we all know that the man or woman who falls and gets back up is always stronger than the person who never falls at all. So, you know, I'm not interested in, in going nuts. And so maybe when they see that and I'm, I'm more curious, they grant me the interview. I mean, the Buffett story is, is to me, I, I suppose, one of my better how I landed the big interview stories. It was 2006. And 
all the way since 1998, when I started at CNBC, people would say, oh yeah, Berkshire Hathaway is run by this guy who never does interviews. He's out in Nebraska. Nebraska? What the heck? You know, who? And they'd say, yeah, he, he bought Dairy Queen, but he doesn't give interviews. Everybody would try. Bigger names than I at CNBC. And then it was the midterm elections. And the news chief, Bruno Cohen, said, I want every single one of you, reporters and anchors, to land a big interview for the midterm elections. Pick your target and go for it. So I thought, let me try that guy in Nebraska. Oh, he'll never do it. Well, I picked up the phone and I called. And his assistant answered, Debbie, and, and I said, hi, it's Liz Clayman over at CNBC. Um, she said, hello, how are you? And I said, I'm well, I'd, I'd like to talk to Warren Buffett. And she said, you know, he's not, he's not doing interv any interviews these days. Okay, for years he hadn't done major sit-down interviews, only the charity lunch interview for the Glide Foundation would he ever come out to do. So I said, um, I, I did what I learned as a as sort of the way I do things. After she said he's not doing interviews these days, I remained silent. I just let the silence go. And she said, well, he is a fan. I thought, of me? Okay. So she said, hold on a second. Boom. He picks up the phone. He says, hi, Liz. I just finished watching you. Because at the time I was doing the 11 o'clock a.m. show, Eastern time. And I said, yeah, how'd I do? And he laughed. He said, pretty well. I like you. I'm a big fan. But you see, instead of saying, Mr. Buffett, thank you so much for answering the phone. You know, unless, unless it's one of these people who expects others to genuflect, because there are some CEOs like that. Most will shrink away if you are obsequious mm -hmm. and too excited. Well, you know, just treated him as an equal. And I said, oh, you're a fan? Really? How'd I do? And he laughed. And, and, and he, I thought to myself, oh, this is going to be easy. So I said, well, let me just tell you I'm calling. Um, the terms are coming up, the elections. He said, I don't know what's happening in politics. So I said, uh, okay, well, um, you know, the stock market is, and he interrupted me and he said, I don't know what the stock market's going to do. And now I'm thinking to myself, Jesus, what am I going to do here? Um, you know, windows are shutting all around me. So I thought, go in the basement. And I knew that he was a value investor. I did some research. And so I said, well, how about I come to Nebraska and you tell me how you value a business? And he said, let me call you back. Give me a number where you're going to be later. Well, I was working the overnight shift, 3 a.m. to noon at CNBC at the time. And I would go home and I'd sleep. So I said, oh, yeah, you can call me at 2. And I gave him my home number. Hangs up. I go home. I'm fast asleep. Phone rings. And I said, uh, hello, you know, trying to sound chipper. I knew it was him. And, and he said, hi, Liz. It's Warren. And we started talking. And he said, well, well, tell me about yourself. And I had heard that he was very down to earth. So I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm very down to earth. And he said, really? Where are you from? And I said, Beverly Hills mm -hmm. with an explanation. And he said, what's the explanation? And I said, I was raised by sons and daughters of penniless Russian and Romanian Jewish immigrants. And he said, really? I bought two of my best businesses from Russian immigrants, Borsheim's and the Nebraska, Nebraska Furniture Mart. And I thought... Yay, for once, for once being Jewish is actually helping me. <laughs> I mean, it was really trippy. And so he said, all right, you can come. But I'm thinking, I hear he's old and quirky. Does he know I'm bringing a whole network camera crew and team? So we had to think about how to let them know that, but I didn't want them to go back on it. He, you know, I thought, does he just think I'm coming? So I called the building and I said, um, do you need my crew's IDs and social security numbers? Because this was post 9-11 in New York. You don't get into any building without ID, social security. And the building said, no, why? So I thought, well, let's just come. And we came and he, we thought to ourselves, if he gives us 10 minutes, we'll stretch it to an hour long special. He gave us five hours. He spent the whole day with us first in his office, then he drove us with a camera in the back of his, his used Cadillac. He drove us to 
the Nebraska Furniture Mart. Then he had lunch with me solo. And then we went to Borsheim's. And then we said goodbye. And all he asked never was, you can't ask me this or don't ask me that. All he asked was, how are you expecting to use this? And I said, we'll probably do a special, but I'll let you know. We came back and we added a special, which we called The Billionaire Next Door. And it was viewed by millions. It re-aired multiple, multiple times. But it was the first time anybody ever got an hour sit down, except Charlie Rose had done one once with Warren and his former wife who had died, Susie. Um, but that changed, that changed everything. He got so much fan mail from his investors who had never gotten to see him like this. I mean, he took us to the Nebraska Furniture Mart and they had the Buffett mattress collection. We're, we were sitting on the mattresses bouncing and testing them. I mean, he's, he is a kid at heart and it was, it was very interesting. It, so, was, it changed things. It really so did. when you get a time like this and you get to kind of see that person and know, do, do you just internalize, yes, this person has that secret ingredient. Like, do you, can you, that inherent greatness, does it just resonate off the people Sometimes. or do you have to draw it out of them? Sometimes. Or? And, and I think that it is a, a product of expectation now that every entrepreneur has to be glittery and well-spoken and exciting and polished. No way. I mean, we know that Mark Zuckerberg was not that person. He was the guy in the hoodie who dropped out. Uh, we know that Bill Gates was an awkward Harvard dropout as well. Warren Buffett was rejected from Harvard. He always says to me, ask them if they still have my application. Um, and I think it does our society no good at all if we only reward the people who walk in with the verbal skills to sell it. Mm. You know, there's something to be said for the quiet genius yeah. who just won't give up yeah. uh the shy person or the one who's a little bit on the spectrum but who's absolutely brilliant i like uh, the show silicon valley because the head guy the ceo of pied piper is richard and he's extraordinarily awkward um but but the slick ones i don't know you know and i've met my share on both sides. We started at Fox Business doing, we got shut out of all of the conferences. Back then it was, you know, it wasn't Recode, it was the, you know, the digital conference, Wall Street Journal, and CNBC was our big competitor as I jumped from CNBC to Fox Business and they would threaten CEOs and say, if you speak to Fox Business, not even second or third at all, You'll never be on any CNBC network, including, you know, Mumbai Channel 10 or whatever. So we decided if you can't beat them at their game, create a new game. So we created our own conference, mini conference that we call Three Days in the Valley. And we set about interviewing the people that CNBC had no interest in interviewing, like three young guys who had started a, a social media company named Twitter. 2008, we went to Stanford Business School where we had tent pulled over there and all these CEOs were coming to us. And we, you know, at the same time we were interviewing the CEOs during those three days of Intel and, you know, Adobe. But then we had the Pandoras of the world. Think about it. Pandora in, in nine, you know, in 2008. Yeah. Who knew? You know, at one point, Tim Westergren couldn't even pay his staff. And he had to say, those of you who want to leave, I understand, but I can't make payroll this week. We had him a year or two into Pandora. We had, you know, Jack Dorsey and Biz and Evan. Yeah. And, and they weren't even on BlackBerry at that point. There yeah. was no iPhone, really. It was just coming. It was just coming. 2008. So You had the, to go on a PC to do Twitter. Yeah. Of the tech leaders that you've interviewed, some of the most prominent that I can recall include Gates, who you mm -hmm. mentioned, yeah. Elon Musk. You mentioned Dorsey also, Eric Schmidt from Google. Um, in your discussions with those folks or folks like that, anybody that, you, that comes to mind, is there anyone or anything about that group in particular as we kind of relate it to these this inherent greatness that really sticks out for you? Was there something... That, that, that just was kind of magic about those guys? That they each, one, each one is very different. Yeah. Um, but there is one common thread 
they are completely unafraid. They can't help themselves. They can't stop themselves from looking around at the universe and thinking, what problem can I solve that people don't even know they have yet? Now, what need can I tell people they have, yet they don't even know they need it? Now, some of that is huckster stuff. Oh, you need this. No, I don't. I mean, and, and those have gone by the wayside. But when you look at some of these companies, and, and I would say Airbnb, Uber, those are, those are now, I mean, I don't care what Travis Kalanick is going through right now and what people say about him. That business model has changed the world. It's massive evolution. And I did ask Bill Gates at Davos, I want to say two years ago, of all the unicorns out there, which one impresses you the most? And he said, Airbnb. They have totally disrupted the hotel industry. And guess what? I have covered the story of the hotel industry fighting back hard, trying to go through legislation, trying to trying to turn the clock yeah. back. Yeah. And you know what? Their air hose is getting stepped on and they'll fight like hell to establish the oxygen again. And and guess what? Too late. That 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 horse is out of the barn. Well, yeah, and and you you know, I mean, there's still a huge role for hotels, but until they do it better, yeah. right. at a cost that's that's quality, I mean, forget it. Yep, forget it. So it's funny, you're you're talking about um, the things that people don't know they want. Mm -hmm. And I know one of the interviews that you never did get that you had said that you wanted was Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Jobs was probably one in a billion Mm -hmm. in deciding that he would give something that they didn't know they wanted yet. Right. That was, that to me, that was a, a, but beyond that, I think I agree with you that there's just not that many people out there that, that really have that capability. Um, there's a big difference between the kind of founders and entrepreneurs that we're just talking about and the folks that you wrote uh, your book about. Your mm-hmm. book, um, which is... The best investment advice I ever received. The best investment advice I ever received. And there, it's filled with brilliant financial minds except, in that except, book. Except, here's the caveat. I have to... I have to <laughs> have to upgrade it and modernize it and redo it because half the people in it have been indicted. <laughs> All right. L- 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 let me try and choose a couple. <laughs> Angela Mazzillo of Countrywide. Hello. Let me choose a couple that haven't. Um, I recollect that in there, there was uh, Steve Forbes, mm-hmm. Bill mm-hmm. Gross, Roger from, from, in you know, my neck of the woods, Roger McNamee, mm-hmm. uh, Jim Rogers. Heck, I remember reading Investment Biker when I was in you know, just out of college. Right. Uh, and there's one Donald Trump, I believe, is also in that book. Yes, he is. Um, that's a different, that's a slightly different mentality, right? Mm-hmm. That, that, that is, that's not the founder mentality, but there's still ma- kind of management greatness and genius in mm-hmm. those guys. Is there some other? Well, if I um, did, if I did a founder book, well, some of them, some of them definitely founders. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you, Howard Lutnick, mm. not the founder of Cantor Fitzgerald, but he founded the foundation, or double the foundation, upon which Cantor was sitting, and then grew it exponentially with this never say die, just keep moving forward, belief and attitude, buying BGC, expanding into real estate. Uh, it is unbelievable what Howard Lutnick has accomplished. He has that entrepreneurial spirit of saying, Let's open an office in London. Okay, now that we've done that, let's open one in, you know, name whatever country, you know, South Africa, Johannesburg. I I, I just, to me, and then getting so devastated by 9-11, where 658 employees, including his brother and his best friend, Mm -hmm. were murdered in one of the Twin Towers where the planes flew in. And instead of curling up in a ball... And hiding for the rest of your life, which quite frankly, I might have done. He turned around and he said, we can't let this company die and we're going to turn around. And he, boy, did he get grief because he stopped the paychecks of the deceased because they didn't have enough cash to keep going. They needed to at least stop the bleeding, triage, and then go for it. And since then, he has only grown. BGC went public. He's only grown the company and... 
that to me is very entrepreneurial. Yeah, that drive and vision, when it, when someone has that, mm -hmm. it almost has no choice but to be relentless. That's what I found anyway. Right, it's that no choice. This is in my DNA. Right, right. Um, all right, so that's financial minds. We've also got business leaders, mm -hmm. and you spent a decent amount of time uh, with Buffett, so we'll we'll right. we'll leave that aside for the moment. But I know you've spoken with Richard Branson, Jamie Dimon, others. That's a little bit different skill set. That's a little bit different. You know, there's a lot of bureaucracy. There's a lot of legal regulation. There's a lot of you know you know time that's just spent managing. Right? Well, let me start with Branson. Uh, regulation today, but he started simply with a record store. Yeah, and he was another one who just said okay, let's bolt on this and let's bolt on that. And the next thing you know, he's got an airline. And the next thing you know, he's he's flying balloons and taking a chance. And oh my goodness, he is so... And now he's got Virgin Galactic, yeah. which leads me to Elon Musk. Yes. And the way that I became the first journalist to go to... Well, it was Elsa Gundo or Hawthorne, I, I forget what he had. A, a, for, spa a for space hangar. Accident? Yeah. I didn't cover Tesla first. I covered SpaceX first. Um, nobody knew the name Elon Musk except, oh, he was one of the co-founders of PayPal. He sold out. He had started this rocket company. And I'll find a story anywhere. And this is where I feel that you have to be passionate about what you do. I was at some cocktail afternoon thing in our neighborhood in New Jersey. And I was talking to some of the neighbors and this one guy. Dave Brody started talking to him and I said, oh, the last shuttle launch is going up. What should I know about NASA and all that? And he said, well, because he worked at space.com and he said, well, what you should know is that the private people, the private business people are now jumping in to the space industry. And I said, like who? And he said, well, Richard Branson, a guy named Bob Bigelow of Bigelow Aerospace. He's out in Las Vegas. He's creating inflatable hotels in space, but don't call them hotels. He only wants them called habitats. A guy named Elon Musk. I'm telling you, very few people knew who Elon Musk was. So I'm writing this all down. He said, yeah, he founded PayPal, but he's got a company called SpaceX. And then Jeff Bezos, whom I knew from Amazon. I said, Jeff Bezos from Amazon? He said, yeah, he's got a company called Blue Origin, but he's not talking about it right now. But he's apparently built a landing strip somewhere in Western Texas in the shape of a blue eye. So I write all this down. I come back to work. I was still at CNBC, 2006. And I, I came back and I said, I got to do this story. I've got a name for it, Space Cowboys. I said, well, eh, who? I explained. And they said, well, let's, let's just have you do it from the business, you know, from the network side. And so Bezos said no. Branson couldn't. He was busy. So I got Bigelow and Elon Musk. And we remote from where they are locations, Vegas and, and California. And after I interviewed them, I thought, these guys are amazing. We have to go out there. So CNBC, I made the pitch. CNBC said, okay. We flew out to Vegas. We interviewed Bob Bigelow, who had gotten his billion or so from savings and loans and all kinds of Vegas stuff. But his dream was space. Then we went to Elon. He said, yeah, I started PayPal, but my dream was to start a rocket ship company, a reusable. They think differently. Yeah, and that and some of it came from when he was a kid, you know, just making yes. kit rockets. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we went out there and we did those guys. And then Bob Bigelow says, well, why don't you come to Russia in a couple of months? We're going to launch one of them. I said, why Russia? And he said, because Lockheed and Rockwell are too expensive. They charge $90 billion to send up a payload. But that's why I like that guy, Elon Musk. He's going to try and make it cheaper. But until then, I'm going to go with this Russian company called Cosmotros. I mean, this is so long ago, but I remember every detail because it was so fascinating. And uh, so I, <laughs> I pitched to CNBC again. I said, I got to go out to the Yazni province, which is just north of um, Kazakhstan, where Cosmotros would do their launches. Cosmotros was basically the old Soviet space program that became privatized. And we flew out there. And we were down there for the launch, and the Russians, yeah, they did it cheaply. They set out card tables with laptops, and they counted down in Russian. It's the most fascinating thing I've ever seen. 
and they had no overhead. You know, you think about a NASA control room with all the expensive stuff. Oh, yeah. And these guys are sitting out there in Yasny. I mean, it's crazy. Sending up payloads, you know, satellites for the French, something for the Taiwanese, not the Taiwanese. They wouldn't do two countries. They would send up everything for anybody, just not the Taiwanese, because that would anger China, and not the Israelis, because that would anger Middle Eastern customers. That may have changed by now, though. So, I mean, when I, so back to Elon, Mm -hmm. that's just imagination, creativity, and then the will to somehow make that real. Okay. I'm glad you just said will. Later, years later, on another three days in the Valley, we went out to interview Meg Whitman, who by then had left eBay and was running Mm Hewlett-Packard. So I asked her about Elon. This was commercial break. And she said, Liz, I'll never forget when he came to us and pitched PayPal. And I said, Elon, what makes you think that banks are going to allow you to muscle in on their territory? And I'll never forget the look that he gave me. It was like he was perplexed. Like, I don't care. What do you, I haven't even thought of that. I'm just going to do it. And then she paused and said, Liz, Elon wills things to happen. Yeah. But so much of that is just keep getting back up. And I tell my own kids this, and I tell people everywhere who get scared when they fail. So what? That's a badge of honor. And if you think about something as simple as WD-40, the stuff you spray in the doors to make them not creak anymore. I once interviewed the CEO of WD-40, and I said, what does that stand for? And he said, water displacement 40th attempt. (laughs) They tried the, the, well, he hadn't created it, but the person who created WD-40 tried 40 times before they got the chemistry right on it. They didn't quit at 10. They didn't quit at 17. They didn't quit at 39. You just never say die. And therefore, you can never beat a man who just won't quit or a woman. That's a phenomenal story. I'm glad you brought up Meg Whitman because this is the last kind of group of folks that I wanted to ask about. You know, if you think about, I know you've talked to Sally Krawcheck. Meg Whitman is one. Uh, Hillary Clinton is another. I'm certain that I'm leaving people out. Um, Is that group different? Is that, is there something unique about them in terms of how they approach things? Um, or are they every bit as kind of visionary and creative and differentiated and thought provoking and kind of, you know, driving? Hillary's a little different um, because as a politician, very polished and as a, again, the president's wife initially, but she was a lawyer and I mean, uh, she was just gutsy. Yeah. Again, a, I try never to see gender either because I think that if you, if I'm big on meritocracy, just pick the best person. I remember when Hurricane Andrew, you know, the Category 5 hurricane was bearing down on New Iberia, Louisiana. I was at Cleveland, Channel 5, and I ran to my news director and I said, send me, send me. He said, Liz, there's a line of people who want to go. He said, also, you know... uh, what, what do you think you can do better than everybody else? I said, I am, I'm going to get out there. I'm going to tell that story, both from a personal and business standpoint and a news standpoint. This guy, John Ray, he didn't see gender. He said, all right, you know what? I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you to that. So he never saw gender. I was very lucky. I didn't have any news directors who really did. Um, but other people tend to. So they think that women might not be as aggressive just because they don't yell and scream. But I had to teach myself to get up in people's faces and give me a shot Uh, because men are really good at that. And back to when somebody asks you to do something you don't know how to do, when men get promoted, this is psychological, there have been studies done on it, men get promoted to a job that they've never done. They usually say, yeah, that I deserve that. Yeah, finally, women get nervous and think, but, 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 but I've never done it before. I'm, I don't want to let people down forget that. You know what? Just go for it. Those women have that and they've had that and and that's how they've gotten where they are. And then there's the jealousy factor. If I had a dime for every male CEO or male in business who said to me under their breath, Meg Whitman just got lucky because she had been at Disney and they needed a good operator at eBay. Really? Lucky? 
that's a stretch. There's so much jealousy. But they said that about Eric Schmidt, too. Because when, you know, the, the founders of, you know, David Filo and, and you know, they those guys, Jerry Yang, they were great to get Google off the ground, but then they needed oh, an no, operator. So, uh, uh, Google. Google. I'm yeah, so sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Sergey Brin, and and of course, so those guys, but also Yahoo. They brought in Tim Kugel as a grown up. Mm-hmm. Um, skill sets are a funny thing. It's very rare to have the founder build the company and then run it as well as they possibly can, which leads me, you know, to Howard Schultz. If I had to pick, arguably he founded Starbucks. He didn't. There were already two. But they brought him in, and he took no salary for the first couple of years. I look at that guy. He's the one. Because I asked him, look, we on our big anniversary, it was 30th or 40th, big anniversary, I said, we all know about the successes you've had. I mean, the Frappuccino turned into a billion-dollar business literally a year after they introduced it, not even. So we all know about the successes. Tell me about your worst days at Starbucks. And he said, that's easy. My wife was pregnant. I wasn't taking a salary. We had two or three stores. We were going to open one in Canada, in Vancouver. And my father-in-law called me and said, would you meet me in the nearby park? Just, I want to talk to you. And the father, his wife's father came, sat down. He sat down and the father said, I know you have this dream to build the McDonald's of coffee where, you know, you go in fast, special, and I think that's terrific. But I need you to get a real job because my daughter is about to have my grandchild. Now, any father has the right to say that. But Howard looked at him and thought, I don't even have the support of my father-in-law. I understand what he was saying, but I wasn't going to listen. And thank God I didn't. He said, the, the lesson I learned from that, and I tell everybody, is only surround yourself with people who want to see you succeed, want to help you succeed, and believe in your dream. Mm-hmm. Believe in your dream. And then tune everybody else out. There's a, a quality that Daniel Kahneman the Economist talks about this uh, delusional optimism. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and frankly, I mean, there's just a number of stories like that where the person could not have been successful in this. They just believed and could see something that, that no one else could see. Now, look, I'm not going to let you off the hook um, about the feminism side. Uh, I know that you're a feminist. I watched you, um, the notes on the conference, the Milken conference that, mm-hmm. that you've given. You're making it seem a little too easy you don't really seem to bristle at the fact that you have to exist in a male dominated industry. You seem like you've been able to navigate that relatively easy. Right. Um, Is there a way that you go about doing that? Is that one of, is that one of your intangible qualities? Well, you know how you have delusional optimism. optimism. I guess I have delusional or let, let me call it gender blind. Again, I mean, I've been a member of the National Organization for Women and, you know, we were fighting for gender, you know, against gender apartheid uh, with the Taliban well before 9-11. Nobody wanted to listen to us. Mavis Leno testified in Congress. Nobody cared. Lorraine Scheinberg was brilliant. And, you know, Ellie Smeal, nobody listened to us. Um, But you got to take both sides of that trade, meaning you can never whine and say, I didn't get that story, that top assignment, because I'm a woman. You just got to do what they give you better, and one day it will come through. And listen, newsrooms are tough places, especially in the 80s. Oh, yeah, sexism. You know, I mean, look, Fox has just come through a very dark period where women, some women, were were real victims and targeted. Um, People, my own mother... Well, I hope, darling, you know, she's British educated, you know, Shakespeare. And I hope, darling, you would never. And in fact, all my friends are asking me and I say, Liz would never. Let me just tell you something. It's that vibe you give off of I'm not vulnerable. I'm going for it. No, I was lucky enough not to, but I made my own luck. I just don't give off that vibe of desperation, whether it's a male or a female, of 
I want this so badly. It's, you know what? I deserve this. I deserve this shot. I deserve that anchor seat. I remember fighting for a weekend anchor job in Columbus. I had only been a reporter. I became a really, what I thought was a really aggressive and tough reporter. They wouldn't let me anchor. I said, why not? And the news director said, the same news director had given me a shot to, you know, take a shot on an unknown. He said, because you've never done it before. You're going to mess up. You're going to screw up. And it's, you know, we're the 34th largest market. We're an ABC station. I said, let me start small. No. The smallest are the five-minute Good Morning America cut-ins, and Good Morning America has a huge viewership. So I turned around. I started coming in on my weekends. In between the 6 and the 11, I would ask teleprompter to roll, and I would have them roll a tape, and I practiced. Handed him the first, the first test. He looked at it and said, this is exactly why I won't let you do it. I just had a bright look on my face. I said, okay. I had a pen and paper. I said, tell me what I'm doing wrong. And he said, easier to tell you what you're not doing wrong. I mean, you're doing everything wrong. You're, you're coming off fake. You're coming. And I, I didn't say, well, how could you say that? I just wrote everything down. I said, I'll see you in a week. Do you know he made me practice for seven months before he finally said, I don't have any criticism of this one. I'll give you a shot at morning cut-ins. He you got to fight and you can't look at it and say, oh, it's because I'm female or, you know, he, you know, so-and-so is prettier or whatever. Just keep fighting. And again, you'll, you'll be that person hmm. who never quit. And, you know, they can't beat you if you never quit. Tenacity is gender blind. All right. Persistence. Yes. The big P, persistence. So, Second to last question, and this you, you set this up perfectly. So CEOs in general, bosses in general, they don't always win the awards for congeniality. Um, they're often not the nicest, most considerate people on the planet. Mm-hmm. Um, and we talked about entrepreneurs being a little potentially delusionally optimistic, sometimes also stubborn, arrogant. We talked to, we kind of referenced the uh, one guy who's uh, right now got his feet to the fire. I'm not necessarily saying that's necessarily a bad thing because sometimes, depending on the point in a company's development, that's what's needed. Um, but what does your experience tell you about leaders with these kind of traits? Is this necessarily a positive, a negative, a neutral? How do you view these? If you're going to be offended, depressed, or, or diverted from your dream simply because somebody above you stood in your way, then you will never make it. Yeah. If there is a wall in front of you, go around it. Can't go around it, climb over it. Can't climb over it, dig under it. Uh, you know, at every stage, listen, in, in our business, firing is has a fancy term, non-renewal of contract. I survived in Columbus for three and a half years through something like three news directors. The fourth one came in, calls me in and says, love you, but you're just not my style. I didn't hire you. I, you got to go. I said, okay, let me finish my shift. And he said, well, you can, you know, you can stay till you, you, you know, whatever, the, the three-week notice back then. And um, I said, okay. And he said, well, you know, you finish with your story tonight. I'll, I was working the 11 o'clock news. And he said, I'll, you can go home now. And I said, that's okay. I'll wait for breaking news. I turned around. I walked out, waited around till 1130. News was over, went home, cried my eyes out, allowed myself 24 hours of tears, and then set about finding another job. All change is good. There's no such thing as failure. There's no such thing as, oh, he, he ruined my track. No, no, you ruin your own track. And I always say, if people aren't happy in their job, that's not the boss's fault. As long as they're holding up their basic end of the deal of paying you every two weeks, it's your fault if you're unhappy. You have to be the engine, the gasoline, and the car, or the electric uh, vehicle in, in that case for Elon. Little nod to Elon Musk. you got to be the battery, too. Nobody is going to help you. If you go in thinking that and you go in thinking, I'm going to get 12 doors slammed in my face, you won't be surprised when it happens, and you won't be offended when it happens. And, and that's what I see in entrepreneurs. They just go for it. And when... A boss or somebody above you, for whatever reason, they're jealous or they don't like you or they like somebody better or it's too political. Listen, every world is a minefield of, and every person represents a potential mine that will blow, blow you up. 
find a way around them or go your own way. All right. Last question. What would you recommend CEOs do to tell their story in such a way that media folks like yourself and investors like me Mm -hmm. get to see these intangible qualities that we're talking about and uh, allow the things that are maybe heretofore unnoticed to kind of come to the forefront um, and, and make them more compelling? I think it's way more compelling to hear about the failures versus the successes. Anybody can look up or see the successes. But to hear Warren Buffett talk about getting rejected from Harvard, being so unbelievably shy that he he sent in money to take the Dale Carnegie How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, actually, he sent in a check, and then he canceled the check the first time because he was too shy to take the class. When he finally got the courage to, to send in again, he only sent in cash knowing that he couldn't get it back. Those types of stories. Or that he walked door to door and asked his relatives for money because nobody would lend it to him. The Howard Schultz's stories of the world. Um, You know, the Tim Westergren stories where they ran out of money and couldn't make payroll. To me, those are way more compelling. You know, to me, I like to tell the story of getting pushed out the door in Columbus. Mm. Or, you know, when I, I asked the man who had hired me and mentored me at Channel 2, who was then became a big news director in Los Angeles, if he would hire me, I thought I was really good by then. I was in Cleveland, and he's and and I think maybe even been through Boston. And he said, "You know, I don't know. With you, there's just nothing I can hang my hat on." Oh my God! <laughs> it was like, okay, that's a punch to the gut. But you know what? I just okay. He doesn't get me. He doesn't see who I am. I turned around. Oh, it was before Boston. I turned around. I sent my tape to a guy I had heard was a real visionary, Joel Cheatwood, who was running uh, WHDH Channel 7 in Boston and just fired everybody and was hiring really aggressive people. I put my own tape together, not my agent. I sent it to him. It was a night that I anchored, ran out between the 6 and the 11, broke a story, got exclusive video, came back and put it together and anchored the the 11 o'clock as well. I showed him little clips on the tape and then I said, this is what I can do in a single day turned around and he hired me. You just have to find people who see you and get you. That to me is, is really the way to go. So that's the end of it. Um, <laughs> but one more question. Before we close. Is Dude, you're good. Anything else that you would, I don't think the, I think the answer is probably no, but I feel compelled to offer the opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, I would say this. Always keep your integrity. You're going to run into people who ask you to do things that really stretch the boundaries. Ah, local news. Well, uh, the sign says no trespassing, but I can see the plane crash. Well, then just get over there. Jeez, really? Yeah. Um, I know people can watch you. uh, Your show is Countdown to the Closing Bell, which airs 3 p.m. Eastern Time on Fox Business, Business Network. And I would like to say... After nine years of fighting, we are now number one. We are beating CNBC. I know people can watch your show, (laughs) Countdown to the Closing Bell, which is now number one. (laughs) Thank you. And airs at 3 p.m. Eastern Time on Fox Business News. I also know that you have something like 85,000 Twitter followers. Can you believe that? Um, What's your Twitter handle? At Liz Clayman, C-L-A-M-A-N. Let's end here. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm sure that the people listening will find it fascinating. Thank you. You're terrific. Thank you so very much, Steve. This has been Intangibles, a podcast created by Antecedent Ventures. Find out more at www.antecedent.vc. I'd like to thank Denton's Venture Technology Group at dentonsventurebeyond.com for being the sponsor this season and a supportive partner. Operating as a boutique within the world's largest law firm, the Venture Technology Group runs with hard-charging tech entrepreneurs to drive growth through strategic business, finance, and legal advice, from Silicon Valley and New York to London, Berlin, Hong Kong, and beyond. Learn more at dentonsventurebeyond.com. I'd also like to thank Ben Glowey, who's been instrumental in helping me record and produce this season. 
I couldn't have done it without him. Find him on Twitter at visible underscore sound. And thank you. Keep an eye out for the next episode. And if you like this one, leave us a favorable review. I'm your host, Steve Berg.